would like to stand, go ahead and stand if you feel more comfortable sitting and worshiping, that's fine too. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to come together with our brothers and sisters in this extended family. We will worship you, Father. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. And let the true worshipers arise on this earth, God. Let your voice be heard. And all of God's people say amen. Abraham, you're the God of covenant, the faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast and let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting, same I will pray. to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Your history can prove there's nothing you can do. You're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. My heart learned when you speak a word, it will come to Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting, same I will praise your name. Great is great. setting same I will praise your name great is your faithfulness to me oh, your faithfulness never runs out and never
from the rising sun to the setting same I will praise your thankful for faithfulness from God this morning. Amen. It's a good day. Would you just do me a favor and turn to the person next to you and say, you look good. No, let's start. Let's do it again. Say, I've got to be honest. You look really good. Yeah. Don't sit down yet. We're going to, we're going to sing another one or two. Just want to go over a few announcements. Any first time visitors here this morning? First time you've been here, would you mind to raise your hand? Some back there, would you welcome them this morning? Thank you for being here. Um, we have nursery, kids' church available as usual. Don't forget the baptism, baby dedication, sign up sheets at the back. Back here, um, we're going to be contacting you shortly about setting up a time to get those things done. So be ready for that. Also, Food Pantry open this Wednesday, 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. I want to say a special thank you to all of those who help with that. Um, we appreciate you. It's one of the things that talks about in Scripture where Jesus said, I was hungry and you fed me to identify the people that, that took care of him. Amen. We know that's important. And we feed the hungry, clothe the naked, do those kinds of things. And I appreciate you guys and all your giving and that you do. We do several things overseas as well as here local. And we can't do that without your help. So I appreciate that. This Wednesday's life group, 7 p.m., uh, bring your family. We will have life kids on Wednesday nights now. So there is a place for your kids. Amen. A lot of people Woo! said we would come if we if our kids had something and the Lord really laid it on our hearts uh, about that, especially Cassie that uh, well, I'll go into that some other time. Um, next week is Kids Church uh, and Promotion Sunday so don't forget that. We're going to uh, focus on the kids. I believe Cassie might even be bringing a word next week. She threatened it. Um, I want to tell you, don't threaten me with coming up here having a word because I'll just take you up on it. You just never know what week. <laughs> you might have forgot it, and then I'll think of it and think, yeah, this would be a good week for you to come share that word you talked about six months ago. But anyway, don't forget that. Um, August 29th is our ministry team meeting. Uh, team leaders um, be 6 p.m. here at the church. Birthdays today, Javina Sandsbury, she's not here today. Um, this week, Glenna Kingsbury, what are you? You turned 40? You look good for 40. Amen. Anniversaries, today is Tug and Tangie's anniversary. Also want to say congratulations to them for their new baby. His name is Crew healthy baby uh, last week Tracy and Kim Beach this week Rich and London it's your anniversary this week happy anniversary to them amen Heavenly Father I praise you for the opportunity to be in this house I praise you for all the things that you're doing I thank you God that you said you would never leave us or forsake us God that you deal with us not only on the outside but more importantly you want to deal with the inside. So, Father, my prayer today is that we just open our hearts. We forget about everything else for the next few minutes. 
We focus on you. We worship you. We open ourselves up to you to plant your word and your seed deep within our lives that it may bring forth much fruit. And I thank you that you are honest with us. We give you praise for it all. If you agree with me, say amen. Jesus, I'm the center of it all. Jesus, I'm the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be so.
could be seated this morning. If you'd like, or you could stand there. It won't bother me. How many appreciate honesty? Amen. It's a great thing. It's a great thing. It is the foundation of every relationship must be built on honesty. So we're going to stay in our I've Got to Be Honest series this morning. Oh, kids. Do you guys want to go tie-dye t-shirts? Did you forget about that? You didn't forget about it. We'll let the kids be dismissed at Children's Church. I told you last week I was probably let you go this week. It was like, God, don't make me a liar. Holy Spirit, you can move anytime you want, but don't make me a liar again, would you? It's good to see all of you. Good to see Jerry back there again. Am I messing anybody? Oh, I couldn't see in the dark who the visitors were. It says my cousin back there on the back and his family. Good to see you, Russ. Anybody I'm missing? You're pretty excited? <laughs> I'm excited about the Word, aren't you? Hey, one more thing I want to make mention of or acknowledge this morning. How about our greeters? How many are thankful for our greeters? They do a good job. I just want to recognize them again. I appreciate them. Um, one study that I read uh, says that when people come to a new church or try out a new church, they decide in the first 10 minutes whether or not they're going to come back again. How many know that has very little to do with the preacher and less to do with worship, but mostly about how they're treated when they come in the door and the atmosphere? Amen? So I'm thankful for the friendly people that we have that, that greet people in the outer courts. Everybody say outer courts. I'm going to get back and hit that in a minute. But if you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of Genesis. Um, I want to start in the beginning. We'll try to end up in Revelation somewhere before it's over. Somewhere in between. No, I'm kidding. I'm going to start in the book of Genesis. Let's pray before we get into the word today. Father, again, one more time, I come to you. And I ask you that no flesh be glorified in your presence. I pray that honesty flow like a river in this house today. Father, I thank you that it is the truth that sets us free. It is the truth. It is your word that divides asunder between soul and spirit. And I just pray today that that division, the good kind, takes place today between our soul and our spirit. And God, that truth and honesty will flow and rise up in your holy habitation and set people free today. Father, I pray you drive out every thief and every robber from within our lives today, from the inside out. And we give you praise for it all. If you agree with me, say amen. 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 How many know that the honesty and the dishonesty, everything started with a lie and it started in Genesis? Amen. The whole mess up of humanity all together started out with a lie. Have you ever thought about that? The whole thing started out with a lie. When, when Satan lied to Eve, and, and got her to question what God had said. If you would pull that up with me or for me this morning. It said, the enemy came to Eve and he said, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, the knowledge or the fruit of the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. I mean, you know, it all started with the enemy telling Eve that if you get enough information about right and wrong, You'll be like God. If you get enough knowledge, because what tree was it? The tree of knowledge. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom, and we're going to come back to that too. I'm just trying to lay some groundwork this morning. But he said, if you'll get enough knowledge, if you'll eat enough fruit off that knowledge tree, you'll be like God. And how many know that they were already just like God and made in his image? Amen? Amen. So the deception, the dishonesty comes when we believe a lie, and then we reap the damnation of the lie we believe. Amen? Does that make sense? Somebody tells you a lie, and you believe a lie, 
How many know that you'll reap the damnation of that lie? I've said this before. If I tell you, you can go run through that picture, that, that front window out there in the lobby, and you won't get hurt, won't matter, just run through it. And you believe that. How many know you're going to reap the damnation of that lie? You're going to reap the consequences of that lie. And so we're in a, this series about I've got to be honest. And we talked about, we started to talk about and break things down last week. I, I don't think we fully got into it, but talked about... Um, number one, we have to be honest with God. And today I want to deal with being honest with ourselves, being honest with ourselves. And so, so keep that in mind as we go forward. There's a voice of truth and there's a voice of lies. There's God's voice and there's other voices. God is truth and the other voices might be. Everybody say might be. You know, because we have friends and we have people that will tell us the truth and they'll say things that are true. Amen? But they might not always be true. How many know God's always true? He's always true. Amen? John chapter 2, um, verse 15, it says, well, let me preface this just a little bit. Jesus comes to the temple, and he finds people being dishonest inside the courts of the temple. It would be like the lobby out there. And again, it made me think of our greeters. I, I, I love it when people tell me that the people just seem so friendly at your church. And when I walked in the door, these people, they remembered my name or they were, they were just friendly. How would you like to have been in this setting where when you come into the outer courts of the temple to worship and you're coming to church, that when you got in the lobby, <laughs> boy, this is going to get me. Somebody was trying to sell you something. Omit that corner over there in our lobby where the T-shirts are, would you? <laughs> See, I got to be honest. But they were, they were, they were selling, they were selling sacrifices to people to to for sin. They were, they were, they were selling the sacrifices for people to get to God. They were, uh, what if you had to when you come in the door? That was the only way you could come on in the door is that you had to have a certain sacrifice. You had to have a certain type. And, and if you didn't have it, they would sell it to you. You could buy it right there. You could buy your way into the presence of God. The stuff we're selling out there is for missions, so there's no pressure. You can buy that if you want. So let's just clear that up, and especially for the people online wondering, what are they selling? We sell some stuff in the lobby, and we use that money for missions. But this is the setting, and Jesus comes to the temple. Everybody say the temple. Where's the temple now? Know ye not that your body, come on, say it with me, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. He doesn't dwell in buildings anymore. He dwells within you and I. He can be and he is omnipresent and, and I believe in that and I believe that his presence can manifest anytime, anywhere and I believe it's more likely that his presence manifests in group settings like this. Because when we come together and we begin to praise and worship, the Bible says that he dwells among the praises of his people. And when there's corporate praise, I think it just puts a bigger draw on him. Amen? I, I, so he can do that. But he dwells within his temple, and you and I are his temple. So what does he do? He comes into the temple, and he sees this going on in the temple, and he becomes angry. And the Bible says that he, he, he went and he fashions a whip. Can we pull that up? And it says that when he had made, another translation says he fashioned or he, he put together a whip of cords and he drove them all out of the temple. Everybody say all out of the temple. And with the sheep and the oxen and he poured out the changers money and he overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves picture of the Holy Spirit, take these away. In other words, it's not time for this yet. Take these away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. How many know we don't sell the presence of God? We don't sell a way into the presence of God. You don't buy your way in. Jesus was the price to get us in. Amen? And then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Zeal for your house has eaten me up. And I want you to see this this morning. If you are the, and I are the temple of God, Jesus is this great example. He goes into a physical temple where they're buying and selling the, the sacrifices for sin, the way to get into the presence of God, and it, it makes him angry. So he fashions a whip, and he drives out of the temple the what? 
the thieves and the robbers. How many would like to have the thieves and the robbers driven out of your temple this morning? The things that steal from you, the things that keep you from the presence of God, the things that seem like it just keeps costing me, that's in me, or that's going on in this temple that keeps costing me, and it's stealing from me, it's robbing from me, and I want to drive it out. How many would like to drive that out this morning? That's my goal. I had, uh, I had this dream last night, and I dreamed I was at this... At this uh, gas station or fueling station, if you will. And, and, I, and I went in there, and in there were, were people that I know, and I'm not going to mention names, but they were ministry people in this gas station. And I looked out just outside the doors, out in the front of the place, and there was this woman. And there was about four or five people, and they were beating this woman down. And they were, it, it was like they were trying to steal from her. They were trying to get her purse off of her arm, and they would sling her in the parking lot. And there was four or five, there, there were men and women there doing this, and they were just throwing her on the ground. And I looked at the people in there, and I said, call somebody or do something. Isn't somebody going to go? And I turned around and looked, and everybody in the store, there were other people in this convenience store, and they all had their cell phones up, videoing it. Standing there by the window. How many know that's kind of how things would be today, right? Now, somebody's out there getting their hind end beat, and people are more concerned with video in it than they are helping the person. <laughs> Didn't get many amens on that. And in the dream, I, I yelled at the, the other people, and they were even ministry people, and I said, aren't you going to do something? And they said, what? And so I went out, and I got in my truck because there was four or five, six of people and they just kept slinging this woman out on the ground and and stuff and I thought I don't have a gun I, I can't whip them all but I'll run over them so I got in my pickup and I come around the thing and I ran over them and the cops came because somebody had called the cops and and they came and of course they arrested me because I ran over people and they they, they put me in jail and they said listen we know that what you did was right and everything, but we just have to do this. You're going to have to be in jail tonight, but you'll be out in the morning. And I wake up. And you say, okay, what's that got to do with anything? I'm not real sure. I just thought I'd share my dream last night. No. I began to pray about that, and, and Cassie and I prayed about it this morning. And, and this, is, this, is, this is what he kept reminding me of. He said, he said, what's going on? The woman typically is always symbolic of the church, and, and, and thieves and robbers are stealing and abusing and keeping her beat down. And what we can't do as ministry people is just stand here on the inside looking out there and watching this thing go on with the body of Christ and not do anything about it. And he said, I want you to run over the thieves and the robbers of people's lives. That's what he spoke to me this morning. He said, I want you to run over the thieves and the robbers. I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about the things that are stealing and robbing from God's people. I want you to run over them, and I want you to do it with truth. So that's my goal. So there you go. Amen. How many feel like... Um, me, when, when it comes to people being bullied and lied to and beat up and stolen from, you just like to run over them. <laughs> I, I have trouble with that. I, I, I have trouble being like Jesus, and where was Jesus? Because him fashioning the whip is my go-to verse when I get in that situation. It's like, well, you know, Jesus had a whip, and he turned tables over. I mean, he, he wrecked the room, amen? So... That's an excuse. I'll get to that here in a minute, too. But let's see if we can drive out some of the thieves from our courts of our temples today. Amen? Mark chapter 3, verse 20 through 30. Mark chapter 3, verse 20 through 30. It says, and then the multitude, everybody say multitude or crowd. Another translation says crowd. Came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread, talking of Jesus and his disciples and what they're doing. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, talking of Jesus, his own family, his own friends, his own friends list, came out to lay hold of him, for they said, he's out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebub. 
and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. How many realize that when you start following God and building a relationship with God, that sometimes your family and friends will think you've lost your mind, and they're going to come save you? They're afraid you're going to get into something that might be dangerous. You don't want to get too caught up in this God stuff. You don't want to get too into this church stuff. I mean, you know, you could really, you could really be taken down a road that's, that's bad, you know, you know, and then they start misquoting verses. Like, you know, the Bible says even the very elect will be deceived in the last days. That, I mean, that's a misquote. It doesn't say that they will be. It said if it were possible, the very elect would be deceived. So, in other words, it's not possible for the elect. How many know that the Bible calls you and I the elect? It's not possible for the elect to be deceived. That's good news, amen? But they'll start quoting stuff like that. And so Jesus is, is doing ministry. He's called his disciples together, and he begins to do ministry and cast out devils and heal people. And the next thing you know, it's like God's working in his life, and here comes his family to rescue him. We got to go get a hold of him because he's went nuts. And then when God's doing things and miracles are happening and things are happening like that, the religious people, the church people who haven't been getting anything done, they get scared. And so they start saying, well, he's got a devil. I mean, he's just operating in a false, you know, it's a, it's a demon spirit that they're doing those miracles over there at that church. Or it's, a, it's a demon spirit that's happening there. That's, that's, that, that's that false fire, it's, it's, it, you know. Anybody ever been around that? Am I just the only one that's been around church people and, and seen God begin to move in somebody's life and family's lives or in a ministry or a church? And those two kinds of people show up, and they always show up because there's a crowd. How many know when God starts doing something, it draws a crowd? The interesting thing to me is in the book of Mark alone, the word crowd or multitude is mentioned 13 times in the book of Mark, and every one of them is a negative. It's a negative thing. How many know that... that um, when God starts working, it draws a crowd, but crowds get in Jesus' way. The thing that most people and a lot of preachers even try to do is draw a crowd, but it's what gets in the way of Jesus. Oftentimes, Jesus would try to play down the crowd. He would tell people when he, when he, when he healed somebody, don't, don't tell anybody. Don't say anything to anybody. Just, just go your way. You're all right. He, he, he tried not to draw attention because the crowds got in his way because God is specific. Amen? I mean, when God wants to really work on you and me, he doesn't really do it in a crowd. The enemy wants to get us alone to kill us and to wear us out. God wants, us to, get, wants to get us alone to heal us and to speak to us and get rid of the noise. One of my favorite songs is that song that starts out, Away, Away from the Noise, Alone with You. I love that song because in my life, I have a lot of noise. Anybody else have noise in your life? A lot of voices, a lot of people talking to you, a lot of things going on around you. And if you're a little ADD or ADHD like me, uh, you get distracted pretty easy and you can hear all of them at the same time. I'm not going to tell you how many I'm listening to right now. I'm kind of being funny. Many things the world tries to celebrate get in the way of what God is doing. And that's why people start wondering about you when God starts working in your life. Because you start changing. Things start getting to you. I was visiting with somebody recently, and they began to tell me that they had started noticing God in all kinds of ways. Anybody else do that? You just all of a sudden you realize God was in that or God was in that. Or you could see a bug crawling across something and see a praying mantis crawling across something, and all of a sudden God's telling you, you ought to be praying a little more. Amen? Anybody else like that? With And, and next thing you know, you, you're crying and and, and God's affecting you, and, and then the people around you start thinking you've went crazy. It's like, oh, they're losing it. I, they must really be going through something. No, I'm just becoming more aware of him and, and where all he's involved in my life, and, and, and I see him. Amen? But we, um, things get in the way of what God's doing, and that's why people start wondering about you when he works in your life, because we can get so busy. Busyness. The word business the way I remembered how to spell it was I, I pronounced it busyness so I could remember, or busyness. 
so I could remember how to spell it. But how many know that being busy is what keeps us from being honest? We're still being honest with ourselves. Stay with me. We're going to get there. You know, the older I get, this is going to show my age a little bit, but before we had Facebook and Instagram and things like that, in my day, the coolest thing we had was like MTV. Anybody remember MTV? That was pretty cool, and that was a big deal. And all of a sudden, they're going to play videos 24-7. And you could just click on See, before that, you couldn't watch videos. You had to rent videos, even music videos. You, you had to rent stuff like that. You had to rent movies and rent a, rent a VCR. Before that, remember the big disc things you had to rent? And you'd rent that plus a movie, and you'd bring that home, cost you like $86, and you'd bring that home and watch that. But when MTV came out, it was like 24-7 music. And I remember some of my friends that would just, uh, even some girls that I was talking to, I'd call them up and, and, and want to talk. And what are you doing? We're watching MTV. I said, well, it's like 3 in the afternoon. I know. I've been here all day. And I'm like, you've just been sitting there watching videos all day? I mean, my dad would have whipped us if we just. Stayed. I got in trouble for watching more than one 30-minute program when I was a little kid when I got home from school, and it was like the Lone Ranger. I could come home, and I could watch one 30-minute program, have a little snack, and then I need to be outside when my parents got home or it was on. But they, they, they'd spending all this time, they just vegging out watching MTV. Or before that, we had movies. You had to rent movies, like I said. And we could just sit and watch stuff for hours. Some, sometimes people would just buy four or five movies and, and just watch movies all day long on Saturday. I know none of y'all do any of that. Binge. Binge watch. Just get lost in the movies. Get lost in the music. Get lost in my Facebook feed. Everybody say scrolling. Keep going back with me if you would. In Jesus' day, there were people who studied the Scripture. They were called scrolls. Scripture was on scrolls, and these guys would, would study the scrolls. They would study the Scriptures, these religious guys. These were church people. These were church leaders that were supposed to be leading people to freedom and setting them free, and they were studying these scrolls. And they had a lot of knowledge, but they didn't have a lot of wisdom. How many know knowledge is not a bad thing? My people perish for a lack of knowledge, the Bible says. But there's knowledge. That means when you know a lot of stuff. And then there's wisdom. The word wisdom means knowing how to apply the knowledge. You become wise when you've learned how to apply the knowledge that you have. That's wisdom. That's why when you get around a lot of older people or people that you say, man, they're just, they just have so much wisdom. They're the people that can take the knowledge things and then show you how to apply that in your life, and it just seems so wise. Stay with me. Don't quit me. And so these guys would study the scrolls. But the thing with them, they were the guys that they were studying the scrolls. They were lost in the Scripture. They were, they were so worried about getting that information, that knowledge and information, the, the knowledge of good and evil and, and, and all these things, that they, they missed the wisdom. The very guys that should have recognized Jesus missed him when he was right in front of them. And then because they, had, they, they, they were so puffed up in themselves, and they were trying to justify themselves by just scrolling. Everybody say scrolling. I'm going somewhere. We're going to go here in a second. They were just scrolling. They were, they were trying to justify themselves. Jesus said at one, remember Jesus said one time that, that you try to justify yourselves with these scriptures and with, the, with the, this, the, this, this word through the scrolls. But stay with me. They would try to defend themselves or justify their actions. They spent too much time scrolling. Everybody say scrolling. Anybody check the amount of time you spend on Facebook on your phone recently? How much time you spend scrolling? Your phone will tell you that. There's a place on there you can go, and it'll tell you how many hours you've spent on that phone. Mine, I didn't know that one time, and mine popped up. And I thought, Psh, that thing's off. There's no way I spent that much time scrolling. I was just scrolling scrolling. And, you know, you get home from a busy day, and you want to just kind of get away from everybody and get away from all the voices. And so we, uh, I don't know if you're like me, I get real stupid sometimes and do stupid things. Like I sit down and I begin to scroll. <laughs> I mean, I didn't get away from any voices. 
I just started scrolling a whole bunch more voices. I started scrolling a whole bunch more cynicism, a whole bunch more attitude, a whole bunch more comparison to other people's lives in my life, a whole bunch more scrolling. I'm just looking at stuff, and all of a sudden, voices start getting louder and louder. Because why? Because I'm scrolling. Everybody say scrolling. trying to justify themselves. Well, I'm not as bad as her. I can't believe they did that. My kids are cuter than theirs. Well, you guys are getting quiet. I'm not trying to be mean this morning. This is fun. <laughs> Have you... Scrolling. Why? Because we're just going to get lost in that. Because why? Because we don't want to get honest with ourselves sometimes. It's not you. I'll just preach to me this morning. Have you ever met someone who won't get honest with themselves? They just keep deflecting when you try to talk about it or you get it narrowed down. They won't get honest with themselves, and it's like they, they just keep scrolling. You ever have a, a teenager that, that's on their phone, and you're trying to talk to them, and they're not paying attention to you, and you want to grab that phone and stomp it? I've had them do it to me. I'm being honest this morning. Amen. I've had my kids say, would you put that stupid phone down? Because we don't want to deal with issues. We just keep scrolling. We just keep scrolling. Matthew chapter 25. And another time, Jesus, or chapter 12, I'm sorry. Chapter 12. Can, is there any way you can back up to 24? I, I know you preloaded them. Is that a problem? That's my fault. Would you give Spencer a hand back there for me this morning? He does a great job. He's back there by himself trying to do all that back there today. I appreciate him and his heart and his effort in that and doing a good job. That's not as easy as they make it look. But I'm thankful for them. I'm thankful for the technology. But Matthew chapter 12, I'm going to talk about a situation here. And I want to bump back one more verse. It says, now when the Pharisees heard it, that Jesus had cast the devil out of a guy. When they heard that, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts. How many really realize Jesus knows your thoughts? whether you say it or not. Jesus said that the Bible says that he knows the thoughts and intents of our heart. We're so accustomed to what things look like on the outside as we're scrolling and people put their highlight reels on Facebook and it looks like they have this perfect life or they don't have this perfect life, whatever it is. And we're so used to comparison, comparing the outside. And, and while we're looking at the outside of them, we're having a conversation with the inside of us. Jesus looks on the heart. Jesus knows what we're thinking. How many, how many, if you really got a hold of that this morning and you thought that Jesus was in this room, how many would come in this room thinking what you might have been thinking already today? Jesus, when he was making the comparison of the law, he even talked, he just used a, 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 a few of the commandments to get the religious people who were trying to trap him. They're always trying to trap him. Religious people will always try to trap you and, and divide and, and, and stuff. And, and, and he just used, it just took a couple of the laws that he made the comparison to. He said, you know, even about lust or adultery, he said, the, 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 the law says thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say to you that anyone who looks on a woman to lust has already committed adultery already. Jesus wants to deal, God wants to deal with your, you and I in our heart. He wants to deal with the inside voice. Everybody say inside voice. 
Jesus knew their thoughts, and he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. He just begins to give them a kingdom lesson right out of their thoughts. They're, they're thinking that they're not being heard. They're thinking that they're sitting back with their cynical, cynicism thoughts going on while God's doing something in Jesus' life, and he's, some guy has just been healed. Devil's cast out of this guy. Miracles have happened. Crowds are beginning to come, and the religious people look at that, and they start thinking stuff, and they think, well, just because I'm thinking it, nobody knows what I'm thinking. And Jesus just turns around and starts reading their mail. But he gives them a kingdom lesson. He says, every kingdom, everybody say kingdom. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. Everybody say house. Everybody say temple. Any temple or house divided against itself will not make it. Amen. Amen. This is, I'm going somewhere, stay with me. We're going to get into our temples this morning, and we're going to see where the division is. But Jesus knew their thoughts, and he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house divided against itself will not stand. Go ahead. If Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. And how will this kingdom stand? He's giving them, keep it on 27, that's fine. He's given them a kingdom lesson, and it bothers me today that it seems like the enemy, and even back then, the enemy, Jesus is making the, uh, he, he's, he's, he's making the point that even Satan would be smarter than to come against himself. But it bothers me that if the enemy is smart enough not to come against himself or come against his own people, why do church people come against themselves so much? Why do we come against each other so much and divide from each other so much? And we, so are, we are so focused a lot of times on how we're different instead of finding out how we're the same and how we're connected. We've got this denomination, that denomination, this group, and this fundamental truth, and this one, and this one. And we're scared to death like the religious people because God might actually be doing something through a person we didn't think he could. God might be doing something in somebody's life that I never thought he would. God might be doing something outside of my fundamental truth box. Am I in the room? How many have ever had God begin to operate in your life and he did something that you didn't think he could do it that way? And then you're going through scriptures trying to find, is that okay? Can, he, can you do that? I didn't know God could use that person. I didn't know God could work through that. How many know God is a lot bigger than we let him be? And so we got to be careful. There's a kingdom against kingdom here. There's the kingdom of the enemy, and there's the kingdom of God. There's the, the kingdoms of this world and the kingdoms of our, of our God. And the Bible says that the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God. And so we need to be smarter than we've been in the past in a lot of ways to this division in the kingdom of God and start working on the unity in the kingdom of God. And when we see a miracle happen or we see God restoring a relationship or we see God working in somebody's church or somebody's life or somebody's family, we don't scroll with our cynical self and begin to judge what God's doing and say, well, I don't know if they're really doing that or not. Are we all right? Stay with me. I'm just winging it. We can't be divided. So that's kingdom versus kingdom. Now, I want to just step over here. Let's just pretend that this is you and me. This is our temple. And we got thieves and robbers out there in the outer courts of our temple. We got, we got this cynicism going on. We got this division within us because we know the word, but yet, I got this other voice inside. Everybody say inside voice. I heard a message months ago about inside voice, and I'm going to seal a few things out of it. But we got these inside voices. <laughs> Let's go ahead. And he says, if I cast out demon by, demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the what? The kingdom has come unto you. That's what jacked them up. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? 
and then he will plunder his house. I don't want your houses being plundered this morning. I want to run over the things that are stealing and robbing from God's people. That's my heart. That is my passion. I want to see people set free, and therefore I might come across like I'm running over some things with a truck, but tell, tell your neighbor he's not after you. He's after the robbers. And the thieves, that's what I'm after. I'm after it in my own life. I want it out of my life. I don't want these thoughts in my life anymore. I don't like these things flying through my head. And I want to know how to do that. I want to, and I have to get honest about some stuff. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds a strong man and then he'll plunder his house? Go ahead. And he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. That's pretty simple, amen? If you're not for me, you're against me. The things that are not godly, they're against godliness. The things that are not God's voice are against God's voice in our life. And we have, and we'll deal with friends next week, some outer voices, but I want to talk about the inside voice today. Have you ever heard people talk about their children and hear them tell their their kids, honey, you teachers, come on, help me. Use your inside voice. I heard a story of a guy telling about his little girl. She come in and she was fighting with her brother, and she's just. Blah, 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 blah. He's like, "Honey, we're in church. Use your inside voice." She said, "This is my inside voice." <laughs> she didn't realize how loud her inside voice had become. Anybody ever realize that your inside voice <laughs> is louder than you thought it was? I want to talk to the people. That say, there are some people that have the inside voice. There are other people that have the inside voice that's really loud. And then there are the third, the third group of people that when the inside voice talks, it just comes on out their mouth. Anybody like that? Anybody ever have a time like that? It's like the inside voice got so loud, it just come out. <laughs> and we're like, shut up, Sally. Shut up, Sandy. <laughs> Jesus knew their thoughts. I want to encourage you this morning that God knows your thoughts. I used to jokingly say to people, it's, I'm, good with, I'm good with not saying it most of the time and not doing it most of the time. I'm better with not doing it. I'm a little better with not saying it. But what I'm after is why do I think that? <laughs> Amen. You won't like it, and I don't really care anymore. I love you, and I love everybody watching online. But I have conversations up here while I'm talking. Can I just be honest? I have a voice in my head sometimes when I'm in the middle of preaching that says, that was the dumbest thing you've ever said. I hear a voice sometimes say, you look like an idiot. And I'm trying to talk to you, and I got this voice. I'm like, shut up. And you guys wonder why I look confused sometimes. It's not you. It's me. You don't want up in here. Amen. But he, Jesus heard what they were saying in their hearts, your inside voice. You know the voice that when you see or hear something, there is a response from that inside voice. God doesn't want to just deal with our external, but more importantly, our internal. How many God, how many know God wants to do things from the inside out? Religion and knowledge and things like that oftentimes want to deal with the outside in. We want to look good on the outside, but inside we're jacked up. We can dress up, we can clean up, put our church clothes on, we can come here and we can fake smile and act like all that, but inside we're jacked up. I want a place where we can come and be honest about the inside of me is jacked up. God doesn't want to just deal with the external, but he wants to deal with the internal. Stay with me. We're making a whip right now. Jesus said on the outside, he said to these religious guys one time, remember? He said on the outside, you're all clean. But on the inside, you're like ravenous wolves. 
These are the religious leaders. These are the church folk. These are the ones that are leading the churches in the community. They look all clean on the outside, but inside they're like ravenous wolves. I'm here to tell you today, you need to be careful what is going on on the inside of you and me and what we let come out of our mouth, especially around our children, because there is nothing more damaging to people's lives and children's lives when it comes to church is when the parents act one way in church or in one place, but then that cynical voice comes out in the car on the way home. You don't know how many people I have sat and visited with that said, I love God, but I hate church people. And if you go a little deeper and you hear them talk and you let them get honest with you, most of the time it comes out because they got sick of seeing people act one way here and then say other things here. Or their parents would act all holy at church and then they would rip the pastor on the way home. Or they would talk about somebody else in the church. Or they acted differently at home than they did at church. You cannot have two masters. You cannot do it both ways. Any kingdom divided against itself will surely not stay. Stand. We can either spend all this time scrolling scriptures, scrolling Facebook, scrolling Instagram or whatever and just get lost in that trying to justify ourselves, or stay busy or shut our mind off or we can say, mind, I'm fixing to deal with you. We can either try to ignore the voices that are going on or we can say, I want to kill this thing. I want to make a whip. I could just see Jesus. He's just standing out there in the lobby of the church. He just kind of looks around and finds there's some rope over there. And he goes over there and starts putting some ropes together and he's tying it in a knot. Nobody's paying attention. And then all of a sudden, here he comes. Could you imagine if you had your little tables all set up in the lobby and you're buying my CDs and my tapes and my T-shirts my, and, I, and you're buying the stuff to get into God and all of a sudden some dude just walks in and starts flipping your table and taking a whip to you and saying, get out of this house, get out of here. My house is not supposed to be like this. In my house, my house is supposed to be a house of what? Prayer, communication with God. Not divided against itself. There shouldn't be two voices in our heads. There shouldn't be this stuff going on. And I don't know about you, but I'm tired of the other voices. I've got to be honest. I've got to be honest with me. Why do I have the other voices? What have I allowed? What have I justified in my life? Why have I allowed that other voice to be so loud in my life? Because I fight that myself. I'm being totally transparent this morning. Uh, there, I, I, when I come to church a lot of mornings, I'm like... I ain't got a word to preach. I ain't got a thing. I ain't even called to preach. I don't even know why I'm in this. God hates me. He just makes me do stuff I don't even like to do. And then I get up here and I feel 10 foot tall and bulletproof and I preach. There's other times in my life I think, man, I am the worst husband in the world. I treat my wife. I mean, I forgot something. Or my kids, I, I got this voice talking to me. I'm like, where did that voice come from? I want the voice of truth in my life. I want to hear his voice and his voice alone. I, I, that's why we need to get alone and spend time with him. We got to shut off the scrolling. We got to shut off all that other stuff and just spend time alone with God and get honest with God and say, God, why am I thinking that? Where did that voice come from and who is that voice? Is that a third grade girl? that smarted off to me at a table one time and told me I talk too much and now I don't think I can speak? Is it a parent that told me I was worthless or nothing that I've allowed to keep being in my life and kept hearing that voice? Is it a coach that I had in high school that told me this and this and this? Is it a teacher? Is it a babysitter? Is it a parent, a grandparent? Is it a voice of, the, of where did that voice come from that's talking to me that is dividing this kingdom. God, I want to be honest. i got to be honest with myself. I'm thinking this, and I don't want to think this about my neighbor. Where does it come from? I want to drive it out. Jesus said you're clean on the outside, but on the inside you're like ravenous wolves. Tell your neighbor he already knows your thoughts, and he already heard your inside voice. So you might as well get honest with him. Amen? It's that cynical voice. It's that criticizing voice. It's that jealous voice. It's that self-demeaning voice. 
I'm not after you. I'm after the voices. Please hear me today. I'm after the voices that are throwing that woman on the ground and beating that woman and robbing that woman in that dream. I want to run over those voices in your life today in any way I can. I'm thankful that I'm in a church where people don't very often act all holy. Let's stop justifying our behavior and cynicism by scrolling in whatever way we scroll. And let's drive out the lying, stealing voices from our temple today. Amen? Jesus heals a guy, delivers a guy, and religious people think he's working for the devil, and his family thinks he's crazy. John chapter 20, verse 23. I don't feel like I'm doing this as much justice as I want to, but. Sorry, I didn't give you that verse, did I? John chapter 20, verse 23. This is after the resurrection. Jesus walks into a room where his disciples are gathered. walks into a room where his disciples are gathered. And if you back up a few verses, he says, Peace be unto you. But no, that's the first thing, that you know it's his voice. When the resurrected Jesus walks into your temple or in your room or in your mind, it should be a voice of peace. Every time Jesus showed up after the resurrection, he said, peace, not frustration, not this angers me, it's my holy anger. That's the other voice. Peace be unto you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive you the Holy Spirit. <laughs> this is before the day of Pentecost. This is the next day. Jesus shows up and he walks into the room where they are and he says, stay with me. He says, peace be unto you. Receive you the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and we think that's really neat. Next verse is what's been messing me up for about six months. I preached it on a Wednesday night. You can go back and look it up. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. I want to read that real slow again. I want us to slow down. We're going to try to close with this. I know I'm early. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. This is post-resurrection. This is a resurrected Jesus. This is after they've received the Holy Ghost. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. If we truly believe the Scriptures we quote that the power that Jesus left with you and I is the power that we would do greater miracles than He would. It was the Holy Spirit that He just breathed and said, Receive you the Holy Spirit onto these men. And then He makes a statement to them, I have just given you power to forgive or retain sin. See, people don't want to talk about this one. But I've been on it for a while because it bugged me. And on a Wednesday night, I, I've always struggled with the story in Scripture of Ananias and Sapphira. In the book of Acts, remember the people that lied about their offering? People were selling everything that they had, and they were bringing it and laying it at the disciples' feet. It was, it was socialism beginning. 
We're going to all have everything in common. We're selling everything because they thought there was coming a time they were going to all have to support each other, and this is the way it was going to be. And so they were all selling their land and selling stuff and bringing it and laying it at the apostles' feet, and then the apostles would divide it up between the people and meet all the needs of the people as much as they could. And there was two people, a man and wife, named Ananias and Sapphira, and they sold a piece of land, and they brought it, some of it to the disciples. But Peter retained their sin. Peter had the choice that day whether or not to forgive that sin or retain that sin. Now, stay with me. I know I just don't jumped off the high dive for some of you. Either he gave us the power that he said he gave us when he resurrected and through the Holy Spirit, or he didn't. Jesus said this. I didn't say it. He gives them the Holy Spirit, and they receive it. And then he says this statement. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven them. But if you retain the sins of any, they're retained. There's only one place in Scripture that that happened, and that's why it throws people so much because, wait a minute, God struck somebody dead. It's like the judgment of God fell in Acts. I thought all the judgment had been poured out. But where did he leave all the authority and the power to operate in and through when he left? Say, in your temple. Know ye not, you're the temple of the Holy Ghost. It's not a good idea to lie to the Holy Ghost. I think Peter mentioned that in Acts when he dropped them dead. Because the husband come and he said, is this, is this really what you got for the land? He said, yeah. And he said, mm, too bad for you. Boom. They come in, picked his body up, drug him out a little bit. Here come his wife. He said, is this what you sold the land for? And she said, yeah. And he said, mm, too bad for you. That's the only time that ever happened. All through the rest of Scripture. Peter had the choice and Peter made the choice to retain the sin. How many know if you retain sin, it'll bring death? Jesus came to forgive sin, all sin. You and I want to be forgiven, but our cynical self remembers other people's. A kingdom divided against itself will never make it. But if we're all the same, how many know will? If I'll give you the grace I got, it's all right. But when I retain your sin, it's retained. Have you ever had somebody who wouldn't let go of something you did 10 years ago? Come on, get real. We live in a small town. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody knows everybody. You knew I'd sing it. God's trying to work in somebody's life. He's trying to heal them and deliver them and set them free and bring them forward in their life. And cynical Susie is on Facebook. Or cynical Sam. I'm not picking on the women. And they're retaining their sin. And it brings division. And it brings death. Because Jesus said, their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. God said, I will, I'm, the new covenant is this way. I, you know, the new covenant, their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. But he also said, go and sin no more. Don't forget that one. So if he doesn't remember our sins anymore, why are we remembering them? I feel conviction in here. Anybody feel convicted? I have a particular person in here that sometimes he'll go up to visitors that we know jokingly and say, did you feel like he called you out today? <laughs> and, uh, but I'm after something. I'm not after you. Keep, please keep that up. I want this staring in our face. Please keep that verse up, John 20, 23. Jesus has resurrected. He comes back, walks in the room, says, Peace be unto you. He blows on them, receives you the Holy Spirit. And then he says this statement to them. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. But if you retain the sins of any, everybody say any. They're retained. I want to close with this. Whose sin is that inside voice 
retaining. See, Satan's the accuser of the brethren. So in an accusation or an accusing voice that you might hear or I might hear, like even when I'm up here, that reminds me of my failures. How can you say that when you did this? That wasn't my father talking. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven them. That works real good, and we think, all right, I'm good with that. I, I, I forgive Bubba. Everybody say any. That includes you. If you retain the sins of any, that includes you. They're retained. And your kingdom will not stand. You will be double-minded. You are now, therefore, double-covenanted. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You and I have got to get to the point where we don't just say we've received forgiveness. And we actually receive forgiveness. And we don't retain it anymore. So when somebody else brings it up, it doesn't even bother me anymore because they're trying to retain something that's already gone. And any other voice that comes to me that tries to accuse me or retain something that I've done gets quieter and quieter and quieter. Why? Because I am not allowing anyone else to retain my sin. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. I'm forgiven. Tell your neighbor you're forgiven. Now let that sink in. Let that sink in your temple this morning. That needs to be the first thing when you come in the temple. Thy sins are forgiven. Now take up your bed and walk. The hindrance to the lame man's healing was he didn't believe his sins were forgiven. Jesus addressed the issue on the inside of him. He hadn't said anything on the outside. He had just been lame a long time. And Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. He knew his thoughts. Your sins are forgiven. Now get up and walk and tell that voice to shut up. Woman caught in the act of adultery, thrown in front of Jesus. Where's your accusers? All the voices had went away. Go and sin no more. It's the most powerful thing in the world is forgiveness. We're talking the next day, people. Jesus resurrects, and he walks in, and he says, here's what you need to understand. <laughs> Receive you the Holy Ghost. Now you have the power I told you that would come upon you, and you'll be able to do everything I did and even more. Did Jesus have power to forgive sins? Let's back up pre-cross and see if he didn't talk about it. Remember one time he said, is it, is it easier for me to say your sins are forgiven or take up your bed and walk? They're saying, what's he doing? He can't forgive sin. Oh, yes, he could. And he said, the same power that's in me, I'm going to put it in you. The same power that raised Christ from the dead, I'm going to put in you. See, we're confessing all the time that we're free, but we still got another voice talking. We're confessing that we're forgiven, but we still got somebody else being cynical, some other voice being cynical and reminding us of our sins and being snotty and smart aleck again, all that kind of stuff. That's why it bothers me when people are smart aleck. And they say, well, I'm just being funny. No, you're not. You're allowing a voice that's not your heavenly Father's voice to talk and come up out of your temple. How'd that get in that temple? Old things have passed away. Now all things have become new. My conversation ought to change. That smart aleck self of me needs to start going away. That judgmental, judgmental critical self needs to go away out of me. That voice needs to be gone, and I'm going to drive it out. How? With the truth. Jesus said, I'm the truth. The truth will drive out every other voice. 
How many know the truth will silence every other false voice that you hear? It doesn't matter what report we get from the news, what we look up online. Are we trying to find information for stuff? And we, and we think, or somebody tells us something, we think that's true. And then how many know we find out that that really wasn't true and we found out the facts on something? Bam! That old story, that old thing doesn't hold water with me anymore. Why? Because the truth came. And the truth has come to set us free. I don't know about you, but this is good news to me. I honestly haven't heard a voice today while I was preaching. Can I just tell you I'm getting delivered by the same stuff I'm preaching to you? Because I'm just as human as anybody else. And the more time I spend being cynical and scrolling and trying to justify myself and my behavior, well, at least we're not doing that. At least we're better than that. And look at that church. I mean, we got this many views and they got that many views. I want truth. I want to do this right. Are you coming? Or you need to go? We can play other music. We like yours better, though. Say, good save. <laughs> I got right home with her. I like to ride home with you. I just made a liar out of myself right in front of you. Said I hadn't heard another voice, and then I let it out. See how easy that happens? That's a matter of fact. I just did it in front of you. I'm sorry. I'd rather have you play anyway. Would you stand with me? Leave that for a few minutes if you would. You got to be honest with God. And you got to be honest with yourself. How many ever heard somebody talk about talking to themselves? That's what I just described today. That's talking to yourself. It's that other voice in there. And some of us accuse our wives of having several voices in there. We're just not smart enough to have more than one as men. We, we just got that other one. I don't want to talk to myself anymore. I, I want to hear him talk. Amen. I want the voice of truth. When I see somebody going through a situation, I don't want my opinion involved in that whatsoever. When I see something happening in the world today, I don't want to see it any other way than through his eyes. I, that's not arrogance. That's not puffy, puffed up. That, that's not anything. That's, I, I don't want the other voice. I don't want to retain sins. Because when I look all through the rest of the New Testament, that happened one time, and I think Peter regretted it. We ain't got time to go into all this today. He said, I didn't come to destroy life. I came to give life. All judgment was poured out on him. But if we truly have him in us and his spirit is moving and flowing in us, we have that option. If we can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover, we don't do it because we don't believe it because we got conversations going on in our head when we get ready to lay hands on somebody. Can I just be honest? Get ready to lay hands on somebody that's really sick or in a real wheelchair or something like that, and you're going to go pray for them, and you got another voice talking to you as you're headed to them. Who do you think you are laying your hands on them? Are they really going to get up? You're going to look really stupid if they don't get up. Instead of that one voice, every miracle where I've laid hands on somebody and prayed for them and seen them healed. See, because I struggle with some of the things too. Why don't everybody get healed? Why do someone? And, and I look back at my life. I prayed for some people and bam. And when I look back, I wasn't hearing another voice on the ones that got healed. I'm not saying I got the method figured out. I'm just saying in my life, 
the ones that got healed, there was only one voice that was just resounding in me at that time, and it was lay your hands on them and tell them this. Lay your hands on them and say this. Go do this. Go here and say that. And I didn't hear any other. I just kept hearing that one voice, that one voice. I felt like David when he walks up to the armies of Israel and his brothers and everybody else is cowered down behind, behind stuff because of Goliath. And the only voice David had been hearing was that voice of truth out there in the field, in the, in being a shepherd. And he's out there with God and just worshiping and spending time with God. That's why it's so important to spend time with God and in the Word of God and hearing His voice and the way He talks and the way He moves and the way He operates because that, that just gets so common to us that when another voice tries to speak, we don't even give it air. There's not a person in here that can call me and tell me that you're Cassie. If I can hear your voice, I'll know whether you're her or not, including my daughters. They get close. Why? Because I have a relationship with her. I've spent time with her. I know her attitude. I know if she's upset. I know if she's not upset. I know if she's happy or she's sad by the tone of her voice. I know her voice. That's how we're supposed to be with God. I want to know his voice and any other voice. I want to drive it out with a whip because it retains sin. And that does not bring life. He didn't give that to them so they could do it and abuse it. He let them know, you have the power to do this. Be careful what you do with this power I just gave you. He just gave them the Holy Spirit. <laughs> now, word of wisdom here, boys. <laughs> Be careful what you do with this. You can kill people with this. This has given you the power to do the most powerful thing, forgive or, 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 or retain. Why would he have said it directly after he gave them that power? God wants us not to retain. God wants us, and, and hear me, I'm not just talking about you and your friend or you or somebody you see on Facebook. I'm talking about you and you. I'm talking about you and you. How many of your sins are you going to retain? How many times are you just going to be so conscious of what you did last night, what you did last week, what you did 25 years ago, and you're still thinking it? You've retained it. God didn't, Jerry. God didn't, Gail. God didn't retain it. I retained it. And if I retain it, this kingdom now just got divided. There's division within me, and anything divided will not stand. I'm trying to encourage you. I'm trying to tell you, you got to let it go. I want to forgive myself. I want to allow myself to be forgiven. We say we're forgiven, but yet you can talk to somebody five or ten minutes, and they'll bring up their things they've done. I'm getting to the point where I can't sit around with the guys and talk about what we did in high school. Yeah. I don't want to know what you did in high school, Trevor. Because it just brings it back up again. Amen? I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm not trying to be holy. What I'm saying is I don't want my kingdom divided. I don't want my house divided against itself. I want this house to be a house of God. I want it to be a house of prayer. That's communication with me and God only. That's what prayer is. My house shall be a house of prayer. Jesus had that. He was in tune with that spirit of God, that voice of God, and that's what he would hear. And God would say, go here. Go sit by the well and talk to this woman today. She's been married five times, and the guy she's with is not her husband. But I want to set her free, and I'm going to wreck the whole town with her. Jesus gets up and says, guys, let's go there. Now you guys go get something to eat. Get the, get the crowd away from me. I got something I got to do here. Remember? You want to raise a dead girl? He goes into the room and he says, when he had put them all out. But Peter, James, and John, faith, hope, and love. He took them in the room with him and he said, made her eyes. My prayer today is that you will quit retaining your sins. And you'll quit retaining the sins of other people. God gave us the Holy Spirit, and it's powerful. 
I'm not retaining my sins anymore and I'm not retaining yours. Let's all walk in freedom. Let's start finding the things that we got in common. Let's see that God can work in ways I might not have thought he could have worked before. And let's just let God be God and let him heal people, deliver people, set people free, build relationships, marriages, children, bring people back to life, heal people, set people free, and we'll quit bringing it up. Amen? Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you today and I ask you to help me to receive, truly receive forgiveness of sin. God, by all means, do not allow me to retain the sins of others. I don't want people to die. I want people to live. Your, your, your word said through the Apostle Paul, the law came sin revived and I died for the wages of sin is death the payment for sin is death God help us not to retain sin because it brings death for us and everyone else let this be embedded within your people I pray today let the truth of your word rise within your people today I pray in Jesus name amen amen